Uh, my name is Dr. Abdul Halim Bella. I'm a consultant pulmonologist in the King Fahad Hospital of the University, which belongs to the University of Dammam. I'm also an academic staff assistant professor in pulmonary medicine. Today, I'm going to show you uh, how to do respiratory system assessment, focusing on chest examination. Now, when we are faced with an assessment of a patient uh, who may have respiratory symptoms and were asked to do an examination, we need to remember our examination is as good as we can relate the symptoms and the likelihood of a clinical diagnosis with the signs. A patient with asthma may have normal examination. So I would like you to be uh, very clear about the role of examination in the assessment of patients. You can clearly see uh, um, our patient here is in bed, covered with a bed sheet, but not all patients are, be, are going to be in the same position. You may see patients in the clinic, or you may see them in intensive care unit or in other areas of the clinical service. The very important thing to start with is to introduce yourself to the patient, take a permission to examine them, have appropriate exposure, and that matters because uh, exposing a man is different from exposing a woman for examination. You need to consider the environmental temperature when you're doing your exposure and the general condition of the patient. Our assessment also includes an assessment of the treatments which are related to the patient. So the first starting point will be introducing myself to the patient and taking permission. Hello, sir. My name is Dr. Bella. Uh, I would like to examine your chest, but I would start by asking you to take your top off, if that's OK with you. OK, you can sit up. And I can give you a hand, if you like, to take the top off. OK? We'll take it completely off, if that's OK with you, okay. because we'd like to do an examination of your chest. OK, sir? OK. Thank you. That's very good. Yeah. Okay. You can rest your back there. You can rest yourself. You can lie back again. Oh. Now, we have got the exposure. The second question which comes to mind when examining our patient is how would the patient be positioned? The current position is acceptable, although 45 degrees will be preferable. And examination of patient sitting up is also a necessary uh, tool in the assessment of signs. When I look at the patient, I have general assessment of the general condition of the patient in terms of being conscious, alert. They're not showing signs of distress. And uh, the patient pattern of breathing, uh, we can see clearly the patient has thoracoabdominal breathing. And the other important things to look at to see if the patient is connected to intravenous solution given antibiotics or fluids. If the patient is taking um, oxygen, for example, what type of interface is used? Is it a cannula, a mask, or is he using non-invasive ventilation, or is he mechanically ventilated? I'd also be looking at the bedside to see if there is a sputum pot, and if there is anything in the pot itself in terms of content, uh, what quantity and what type. Um, I would start also by asking our, my patient to take a deep breath in and out. Can you take a deep breath in and out? <sighs> Big breath and out. And breathe out. Comfortable. That's fine. Thank you, sir. Now, breathe normally now. That gives you an idea at the start of the examination if there are likely pathological processes, which we mean by that is limitations in the movement of the chest or abnormal types of movement or uh, there is difference between the two sides of the chest because comparing the two sides is very important. We also do this when we sit our patient up. Now, when I look at my patient having taken the permission and exposure, I will now examine the patient's hands. I would like to examine the patient's hands and Examining the patient's hands will be very helpful in the start of assessment. Now, I would like to have the patient, the two hands, 
Okay? When you shook the hand with the patient, you could have a feel of the temperature there. Now, the important things to look at in my patient would be commonly looking for pallor, looking at the nail beds and the bone. We also look for evidence of smoking, tar staining, evidence of respiratory failure or peripheral cyanosis. We also look in our patients for evidence of wasting of the small muscles of the hands. And we specifically look for clubbing. Clubbing is an important sign. It has four grades. The way we look at it, we need to specifically look from the side at all the fingers, to look at the nails on the two sides and make sure we're not missing clubbing. The four grades will be shown later. Another thing to do for patients, if you're not sure of the, about the presence of clubbing, is to ask your patient to try to put their nails opposite to each other to see the angle where they meet if at the nail bed there is an angle, what we call Shamroff test. We also assess the depth, uh, the interpharyngeal depth and the nail depth. Usually the interfer distal interpharyngeal depth is, hi is higher than the nail depth. If they're equal or if the nail one is, is bigger, that indicates clubbing. I would also look at the patient hand in the palm to see if there is palmar erythema or if there is any wasting. This would be the basic examinations in a hand of a patient with respiratory disease. But there are other signs we sometimes see. A patient who does have rheumatoid hand, you'd expect some respiratory signs. A patient who has peripheral vascular disease may have some respiratory or cardiac disease. Any skin uh, uh, lesions in terms of presence of eczema, signs of dermatomyositis may be related to the lung. So all these other extra signs need to be related to the examination. But the basic ones would be to look for pallor, clubbing, cyanosis, wasting of the small muscles of the hands, presence of palmar erythema. Now, after I do this examination, should I find any abnormality, I would think about correlation to the respiratory findings. So I would add as a next step by asking my patient to put his hands out, spread the fingers to look for tremors. Commonly fine tremors are seen, thank you sir, with, uh, as a side effect of medications like mimetics, or could be an indication of a primary disease like hyperthyroidism or some patients may have tremors due to the hypoxemic lung disease they have. An important thing to do in assessment of patients with respiratory disease to look for evidence of respiratory failure with encephalopathy and we look for this for what we call flabbing tremor. So I would ask my patient to stretch his hands out, bend his wrist up on the two sides and spread his fingers. A normal person will be able to sustain this, but a patient who is in encephalopathy, being respiratory or metabolic, they tend to have a flap, so the hands cannot stay in this position. Thank you very much, sir. So the hand examination is a starting point in the assessment of our patients. I would also assess the pulse, which had been addressed in the cardiovascular examination, and check blood pressure, because both of them are important in the respiratory assessment of our patients. Uh, examination of the, of the face of our patient give us clues and give us a lot of help as to what the likely cause of the respiratory symptoms are. It also gives us an idea about presence of complications of the disease or presence of severity. I'm going to start with the basic examination. We look at our patients. Uh, the presence of active alien enzyme indicate respiratory distress. Uh, we look at pallor. We look at if the patient has a particular type of patient, for example, lupus uh, on the face, uh, any rash may indicate presence of uh, SLE, uh, presence of bilateral ptosis may indicate presence of um, myasthenia gravis with respiratory complications. So I would examine the patients by one, sir, I'm going to look at your eyes. So again, I'm looking for pallor. So looking into the uh, conjunctiva, 
A pallor can be seen in coronary respiratory diseases as also sometimes congestion or polycythemia in hypoxemic diseases. I would also look in our patients for presence of jaundice. Can you look down, sir? You can look down, sir. Can you look to my hand? Okay. And if there are any signs of scleritis, episcleritis, which we see with connective tissue diseases. I look at the eyelids, make sure there is no ptosis. Presence of ptosis in one eye may be a component of Horner syndrome, which we may see with lung malignancies. And that includes partial ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis in uh, some of our patients. Now, I would ask my patient to, uh, to open his mouth, and I look at the lips from outside for presence of central cyanosis, and inside also, I also look for pallor, and I would like my patient to open his mouth. Okay, can you open your mouth? Can you put your tongue like this? Okay, and look for central cyanosis in the tongue. These are general for all respiratory diseases, but also helps to comment on the dental hygiene as may be associated with atypical infections in the lung, like actinomycosis. And we look for ulcers, like we see typically with some of the vasculitic diseases, like Bahgets, which we see in this area. I would comment if there is any enlargement on the parotid glands, which sometimes see, apart from uh, common viral infections, we see it with lymphomas and sarcoidosis. Now, to recap, the important things to look at in all patients would be examination for pallor, polycythemia, jaundice, presence of Horner syndrome, active alien anxiety to indicate severity, cyanosis, ulceration in the mouth, and parotid alignment. We should not forget if a patient has a particular phrases like Down syndrome, you need to consider complications of Down in terms of pulmonary complications. If you have myothenic phase, myopathic phase, or lupus phase are also important. With the examination of the patient face, we follow that by examination of the neck. And we do that by examining the patient from the back. We look at all lymph node stations, starting from the submental, submandibular, preauricular, postauricular, occipital, and then we go to the anterior group and the posterior group cervical. This is an important part of our assessment and may also help us to come up with potential diagnoses if you have significant lymphadenopathy. Looking into mediastinal shift by examining the trachea is also important in different ways. One, any significant pathology in either side of the lung can cause either deviation of the trachea away from the lesion or towards the lesion. Two, the distance of the trachea to sternum notch can be reduced in patients with severe obstructive airway disease and accordingly the descent with breathing. So in my patient, I will try to see if the trachea is central by, if you have the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid, you can go down there, so it's central here, and you can check right or left. If you have tracheal deviation to particular site, you need to ask yourself questions why. Remember, early on we asked the patient to take a deep inspiration. Should one side be less moving, then we have to relate the one less moving to the tracheal deviation to, have, uh, to consider possibilities in terms of pathology. Now, I would also ask my patient when he's sitting up to take a deep breath in and out, big breath, and that also gives you more insight into the symmetry of movement of the chest with uh, breathing. That's an important test to do. Now, uh, examining the chest of the patient um, includes examination of the anterior and the posterior side of the chest. Remember from your anatomy, you have three lobes in the right side, two in the left side. The contribution of each to the relevant signs in examination differs. So we have to consider this when we're examining our patients, we have to keep them comfortable, examine from the front, sides, and the back. Now, the examination of the respiratory system or the chest examination has a predictable system, including inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Now, 
to facilitate better exposure, we can ask my patient to try to put your hand like this, and that will expose a bigger area for the examination. So I will inspect the patient for presence of deformities. Particular I want to look for from the side is a parallel chest due to severe obstructive airway disease or any other deformities. You can look for uh, Bechtus carinatum, excavatum, or kyphus coliosis. We also look for scars, and we need to know where particular scars are found, and they do help you to give you an idea about previous surgical interventions for our patients. We look for presence of distended abnormal veins, and that may correlate with central obstructive disease in the central venous system, which may be related to cancer or uh, benign causes. We look for presence of swellings or nodules. We also look for presence of intercostal or subcostal recessions, which we see when our patients are in distress. So an inspection of the chest, which I'm currently doing from the front, is important. We look for deformities, scars, distended vessels, presence of mass lesions, or any other abnormalities, namely intercostal or subcostal recessions. The next step is to assess the patient for presence of tenderness or subcutaneous nodules or crepitus and confirm what we have assumed by seeing the patient on inspection. Basically to see if there is difference in the chest movement between the two sides and if there is